So this is where I get to draw out for you the quadrants and how they fit together and how they work. And it's one of my favorite things, I'll have to admit. Uh, I'm, an, I'm an engineer at heart, so this is where I get to like think uh, in flow charts, which is the way I usually think. So here's how it came about. When I started playing this with my clients and, and to the degree that my friends would let me with my friends, uh, what I noticed was for each, it, each particular thing that we were doing, like if I said, how do you want me to touch you? Or they said, how do you want me to touch you? All, you know, whatever combination there was, there were two th questions or two factors. One is, who's, the, who's doing the doing? And the other is, who's giving and who's receiving? Or who is it for? So you can look at one person touching another and you can say with pretty good certainty, who's doing the doing? That's clear. But who is it for? That's a different question and it's not always who it looks like. It's not always by definition for the person who's being done to. So this, um, this chart will, if you've played the three minute game and if you've gone through the lessons, this will explain what you've already noticed. This is just a way to see it visually, but you've already felt it. If you haven't done that and you're just starting out the process by watching this video, it may or may not make any sense. In fact, it probably won't. And if you find yourself sort of scratching your head like, what is she talking about? Well, how can that work? Blah, blah, blah. Then that's because you haven't felt it in your hands. When you feel it in your hands, this will become very obvious. It just sort of falls in your lap. So, so after I was playing the three minute game a while and, and I noticed there's a difference here, who is doing is a different question than who it's for. And so I noticed that they, they fit together, uh, that those two, quest those two factors overlapped. And so I began to think of it like this. So one person is doing, the other person is being done to. The other factor is who's giving and who's receiving. And it's like in the old paradigm, there was one line. The doer was the giver and the receiver was the one that's being done to. But we've taken that one line and gone... So now there's two lines, two different factors, and this is how they overlap. So what you've already played with in the lessons and in the three-minute game, here's how they fit together. When you are on the, on the doing half, you're either giving, it's for them, or you're receiving, it's for you. And knowing the difference is what makes them each really great. When you're on the done-to half, you're either giving, that you're giving your body for them to be able to play with, or you're receiving, you're being touched in the way you want. So those are two options. And when you're on the giving half, you're either giving a gift of doing or you're giving a gift of access, letting yourself be done to. And when you're on the receiving half, you're either uh, receiving what someone's doing to you, you're being done to, or you're receiving the gift of being able to do what you want to do. So let's name them, uh, which you've already done in the lesson. So when you're doing and you're giving, this is what most people call give. And um, it's sort of the, the normal or right way, the most comfortable way that most people think of as giving. The, the uh, essential dynamic here is like a massage. A massage is clearly for the benefit of the person who's on the receiving end of it. So when you're doing and giving, that's give. And your partner over here is being done to and they're receiving the gift. So I call that receive. And this is, this is what most people call receive. Um, it's a different use of the word than this receive. So remember back at the beginning we talked about receiving. Receiving can mean uh, being on the receiving end of some action. 
or it can also mean receiving a gift, whatever form that gift may take. Well, this refers to the fact that it's a gift for you. It, it comes in different forms. This receive refers to both of those happen to be happening at the same time. You're on the receiving end of being done to, and also you're receiving a gift. Um, so that's a give and receive. In giving and receiving, the, the action goes this way, and the gift also goes that way. And the sort of, as I said, the quintessential example of this is a massage. Okay? So that's giving and receiving. What about the other one? So uh, in lesson two, when you were feeling your lover's hand or feeling your partner's hand for just to enjoy it for yourself, you were doing and you were also receiving the gift. And this is what we call taking. And as I explained there, Take is a word that can have a lot of connotations for different people and can, and have, what I've noticed is it can be a little off-putting. So what's important to know about this form of taking or the taking quadrant is that it's not stealing, it's not using, it's not usurping, you're not taking away something. Sometimes people really have a hard time just getting over the word. But the taking quadrant is receiving a gift and you're receiving a gift by taking action. So it's like you have to go and collect that gift. You have to take action to collect the gift. And the gift that you're receiving is the gift of access to the other person. So the taking and, and receiving, the, I mean, I'm sorry, when you're doing and you're receiving the gift of access, you're in the taking quadrant. Your partner is over here. They are uh, giving the gift of letting themselves be done to. So that is allowing. And again, allowing is not uh, putting up with, tolerating, enduring, going along with, or subjecting yourself to. It's a true gift in which you give access to yourself gladly and with a full heart. It's a true gift. So you're giving a gift and the gift is essentially you, letting yourself be done to. So that's allowing. In the taking and allowing dynamic, the action goes that way, but the gift goes the opposite way, goes from the allower to the taker. And so you can see that the, the, the dynamics are opposite. And if you were to look in the window at two people, you know, one person stroking someone else's arm, you'd be able to tell who was doing and who was being done to, but you would not be able to tell, probably, who was actually giving the gift and what the gift was. Um, you couldn't really tell who was it for by looking. So the quintessential example of this dynamic is um, uh, ravishing. And we'll come back to that. What you might notice is that a massage, uh, this dynamic, is uh, available in many, many different kinds of relationships, many different kinds of situations. Not only a professional massage therapist, but you and your partner, you're rubbing your grandmother's feet, you're holding your children to comfort them, um, you're having some physical therapy and the, the person's moving your joints around. All those fall in this dynamic because they are for the benefit of the person who's being done to. And, uh, yeah, lots of different flavors of this, lots of different reasons for this, lots of different kinds of situations in which it's appropriate. This dynamic, um, take and allow, if you went to your massage therapist and they started out giving to you, but pretty soon it felt like they were just feeling you up, major creep. So this, this dynamic almost always happens only among lovers. Uh, the other place that you'll see it is in small children where they're, you know, you pick up a small child and they want to reach out and stick their finger in your nose and feel your hair and just sort of feel you and climb on you and experience you. That can also be this. But among adults, it pretty much is only happens among lovers. And 
this is why I call this particular dynamic the lover's touch, and we'll come back to that later. So, two different dynamics. You want them both in your life, at least I do. Most people feel like this is the right kind, and the, therefore it's kind of the only kind that's available, and they think that even in um, sexual play or lovemaking, this is the only right kind. And this kind gets sort of, for most people, it's, they don't even know it's there, don't know how to find it, or it's very confusing because what, you know, what do they really want, what's about consent, and all that stuff, which, you know, we'll be going into. But for most people, this is just absent or really misunderstood or very scary or confusing or lots of stuff. Um, and yet, among lovers, this is the one that really lets you play and express your eroticism and express your desire for your partner. So, in life, you want all four. And in your relationship, particularly with your lover, you want all four. You want to be able to access all four. So, the other thing that's important to know here is that what actually creates these? And they exist only within a certain condition. And that is consent. These things happen within the circle of consent and only within the circle of consent. So consent, most people think of consent as meaning permission. And when you hear people say, yes, I give consent, what they mean is I give permission. But permission is only one kind of consent, and it's not always the kind that fits your situation. Consent, as I'm using it here, is in a much broader meaning, which means it's the agreement. What's our agreement? Who wants what? Who's doing what and for whom is it? So when we have consent, it not only includes what's the activity, but it includes what's it, who's it for? Whose desire are we following? And uh, so when I say, may I feel your legs, and you say, sure, then we have consent. And the, because I have said, may I, and I've asked for permission to do what I want to do, that consent creates this dynamic. May I feel your legs? And you say, yes, you may. So we're doing this. If I say, how would you like to be touched? Or would you like, a you look tired, would you like a foot rub? I'm making an offer to go here, and you're saying, yes, I would love that. And now you're here. So again, it's our agreement that has created this dynamic. So all of this happens only within the circle of consent. And it's the consent that creates the dynamic. That's how you know which one you're in. It's also true for each of these that each of them is distinct from the other. None of them are the same as the other. Uh, it's easy to confuse the, it's, when you're in it, if you, before you learn how to tell the difference, you can sometimes be not sure which one of these you're in. Or you can sometimes be sure not which one of, which one of these you're in. Um, but once you learn them and understand uh, that your agreement is creating that, then each of these is a very distinct experience. It's different from the others, and each of them is inherently pleasurable. In fact, if it's not pleasurable, you're not really quite in it. Something's off. And it, it, the fact that it's pleasurable is one of the signs, one of the signs that you're in it. It's not the only sign, however, because they're all pleasurable. So the fact that you are experiencing pleasure does not indicate which quadrant you are in. So you, I can be allowing you to feel me up in whatever way we've agreed to, and it may feel fabulous to me. Oh, therefore, I feel good. I'm experiencing pleasure, so I must be over here, I guess. No. What determines what quadrant you're in is the agreement that you have made not the fact that you're experiencing pleasure, because they all are pleasurable. Each of them will also challenge you in its own particular way. There are some themes that are pretty common. I'll be talking about those. 
but uh, they're also unique to you that each of these will challenge you in a, in a different way. And quite often the challenge is because you don't quite know who it's for. And usually once that clicks, then the rest of it starts to make sense and sort of opens up for you. So each of them is distinct. Each of them is created by the agreement. Each of them has its own challenge for you. And each of them has a particular aha or a, a gift for you. Each of them has its own way that it frees you, that liberates you. And um, each of them also, uh, and, for, and, and I'll give you an example of that. Uh, taking is the one that's hardest for almost everybody. And, um, and until you, if you don't know that this even exists, or you kind of have an idea, but it looks horrible and just terribly scary because it seems selfish, if you don't have access to this one, then the only option you have for touching anyone is this one. And so you're here pretty much all the time, but the problem is that if you don't really have access to this one, this one's going to be kind of uh, muddy and mixed up and confused because it, it, it's trying to do more than what it's really there for. You're trying to get something by giving. Um, and so when you learn how to access this, you become free to play here, which you weren't free to play here before. And that means you start to understand that, yes, sure enough, you are allowed to touch and enjoy and be with this person. And your, your desire and curiosity about them can come out and play, which doesn't really get to come out and play here much. Your desire, your curiosity about them, your ability just to move and express yourself in ways that are spontaneous and authentic for you, all that comes out of here. It doesn't come here. So this, when you access this, a lot of things get more freed up. Like confidence is really what's born here too. That doesn't come from here. So that's an example. And they all have those examples. And I'll come back to those. We'll, we'll be talking about each of them separately. They also, in my experience, each have a particular kind of um, a spiritual nugget or a, an emotional aha or sort of a gift. You can think of it as philosophical, however you want to think of it. But, um, but I've noticed this for me, and I've noticed it in a lot of other people too. Uh, so I will, I will come back to all those in a moment. So I've said elsewhere that this experience is kind of a microcosm for how we approach relationships in our lives in general. And as I've pondered my own life, as I've explored this over the years and made enough mistakes to sink a battleship and to really clear it up for me, um, what I've noticed is this, the sort of the, the essence of giving is that you're taking action for the benefit of somebody else. So you're taking action to benefit someone else. And that's the essence of giving. And that's called service. We want to be able to have, we want to have lives in which we are useful to other people and offer service, whether we get rewarded or not. And so that's a really important part of life and would be a pretty pale life without the ability and access to do that. So giving is about taking action to benefit others. And this is also called serving. In fact, often I call this quadrant serving because it's just easier for me to keep track of. So receiving is the ability to benefit from the action of others or receive the benefit of someone else's actions. Also a really important skill to have in life. It would be a pretty paltry life as well if you didn't know how to receive benefit from someone else's actions. So that's the, the essence of those two. The essence of taking is taking action for your own benefit. Also a pretty important thing to be able to do in your life. In our society, we have a very confusing relationship with this dynamic here, taking action for your own benefit. 
on the one hand, we we think of ourselves, we think of our culture as being, you know, me, 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 just get what I can, um, sort of hedonistic, and we do have a certain ability as a culture to be incredibly selfish in regards to how we treat the rest of the world. That's a whole different topic, but we're taking action for our benefit all the time. On the other hand, what I've noticed is that most people have a have a pretty big difficulty actually entering this quadrant and experiencing pleasure in a very direct, simple, tangible way. And I believe those two are connected. I'll talk about that later in the taking quadrant, but but I think that the our inability to actually experience real pleasure really contributes to our ability to our tendency to grab, 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 grab everything in sight. So I'll, I'll come back to that there. So anyway, taking the essence of it is taking action for our own benefit. In the essence of allowing means allowing others to take action for their benefit, even if it affects us. Allowing others to take a benefit even if it affects us, or, or you may be even shorten it saying allowing others to benefit from us. So the gift that we're giving here is ourselves. The gift that we're giving here is our action. So that's sort of the, um, the, the essential elements of what they are. The um, kind of spiritual nugget that, that I have found here. You may find something different, but this is what's been true for me. The, the gift and the aha in the giving quadrant has been serving. This is serving. That's a, a, a spiritual path all its own. And I've also learned here to, to what the real meaning of generosity is. So serving and generosity. And the, the spiritual aha here for me has been gratitude. In states of receiving quadrant when you have time and you really just melt and delve into it and and just there's a sort of an altered state that you can get into there because it's just you and your sensation you're not trying to do anything back there's some really deep and profound states that you get in here that that are available no other way that's true of all of them there are states that are available no other way but the just experience in your body with that much sensation and that much pleasure doesn't have to be sexual even, but that ah, uh, it really has wake, wakened for me my awareness of gratitude. Um, allowing, this is about surrender. Surrender is a word, again, there's a lot of meanings to, to surrender, and um, this particular microcosm of surrender, you're surrendering to the other person. In this one, you kind of surrender to your sensation, that's true, but in this one, you're surrendering to the other person, and so um, you take responsibility for what your limits are, and you don't give up that, you don't surrender that, but once you make that agreement of how they may enjoy you, play with you, and use you, then you get to just surrender. And it's also a kind of generosity and um, uh, also profound states there. And surrender is also a spiritual path or spiritual principle all its own. So this is where you get to really explore that. The taking quadrant kind of really surprised me because what I found here was integrity. And here's how I noticed that. 
if I want to do something and I don't know that it's okay for me to want that or even sort of how to want that, um, then what I have to do is to offer to do it and sort of pretend that it's for you. So if I want to get my hands on you and just enjoy you because you feel yummy to me, if I don't know how to do that or even that it, it's accessible or it's possible or that it's permissible, then what am I going to do? I'm going to offer to give you a massage. But giving you a massage, it's true, I'll get my hands on you, but it's not really what I wanted. I just want to feel you up. So in the taking quadrant, you learn to take full responsibility for what it is that you want to do and the fact that you do want to do it. And that has taught me integrity. And what I've come to realize here, uh, and I'll talk about this later in the consent video, is that, and this in particular has taught me that, is that if there is something that I want and it involves another person, the only thing to do that has integrity is to ask for it. That means hinting, making an offer, trying to get you to want it, or just taking it anyway. Those, none of those have integrity. The only thing that has integrity is if I want something that has to do with you, the only thing for me to do is ask for it. This is what taught me that. Okay, so the circle of consent. Uh, all this happens only because you have an agreement. You can feel like you're in one or the other, um, but it's your agreement that determines where you actually are. What happens most often in heterosexual sexual relationships is that the man thinks he's here because he's doing all the stuff that he thinks he's supposed to do and that hopefully she likes. He thinks he's here. And because he feels like he's here, he assumes that she is here. But she is, feels like she's here because she's letting him do all the stuff that he likes to do. And our sort of cultural paradigm about heterosexual sex is that he does the stuff and she lets him do the stuff. So she feels like she's here. Well, if she feels like she's here, she assumes that he's here. And so she has this idea in her mind that, well, he's just doing what he wants to do. He doesn't really care what I want to do, what I want. And he has this in his mind that, well, she's getting all the benefit of me doing all the work, and, you know, I I'm the one who's doing all the work. So they're both over here, so who's receiving anything? Actually, nobody. It's not to say that you can't find some enjoyment there. People find enjoyment there, and that's where they spend, many people spend their entire lives trying to do that. So the point here is that whichever one you feel like you're in, you will assume your partner's in the opposite one. If you feel like you're here, you'll assume your partner's here. If you feel like you're here, you'll assume your partner's here. And most people feel like they're in the giving quadrants most of the time. So how you feel is not an indication of which one you're in. And the fact that it's pleasurable is not an indication of which one you're in. What indicates, what determines which one you're in is what did you agree to be in? And then find that one and stay in it. And the more you solidly you stay in yours, the more solidly the other person can stay in theirs. And so when, uh, particularly if you're a couple and you're learning this together, what you'll find is that as you each get better at being clear about which one you're in, the, you learn together to hold it so that you're more firmly in the one that you've agreed to be in, and then you can dive in deeper and deeper and deeper. And that's when it gets really fun. So one more part that I want to add here, and then uh, we'll take these apart and look at each of them. That's this. So we've been talking about what happens inside the circle of consent. It's also possible to have the same dynamic but without consent. So each of these quadrants has a shadow. And this is what they are. The giving, uh, if you are sort of stuck here or you're trying to give without really the, what the other person doesn't really want it, the shadow of this is the martyr. 
and you forget yourself. <clears throat> you forget that what you want also matters. I've had many people who've told me, wow, thanks for showing me that what I want mattered. I really didn't know that. So the shadow here is the martyr, the forget yourself, the do-gooder, trying to... Uh, trying to do good things whether other people want them or not. So that's the shadow of give. Um, also the shadow of this when you're, you're taking action for someone else's benefit. This is the slave. And I'm not talking here about role play or erotic role play where you know you play with one person having all the power. I'm talking about the actual slavery that happened in our country a couple hundred years ago and still happens in other places. That's the essence of slavery is that you're giving your actions for someone else's benefit and you don't have a choice about it. So the receive, the shadow of that is uh, lazy, um, entitled, and this is the slave owner. This is the person who's receiving all the benefits of somebody else's action uh, even though they didn't really want to give it. And again, we're not talking about um, slave as a, as a kinky BDSM way to play. We're talking about actual slaves in our country. So that's that dynamic. So it's a beautiful dynamic inside the circle of consent. Outside the circle of consent, pretty ugly. So, allowing and taking. Outside the circle of content, the shadow of taking is groping, um, using, uh, rape, assault, and war. Also, inside the circle of consent, really beautiful. Outside the circle of consent, pretty ugly. Um, and this one, the fear of going here is what keeps many people from actually discovering this. So what's the shadow of allowing? This is the, oh, this is another one here is perpetrator. So the shadow of his allowing is the doormat. The um, uh, uh, passive, tolerate, endure, the victim. And again, I don't mean necessarily victim as a mindset, the, the mindset that we all want to not have, basically, but victim as in real life. You, you walk down the street, you get punched. So, um, again, taking allowing inside the circle of consent, really fabulous, very fun to play in, absolutely luscious, and essential to having a full and mature erotic life. Outside the circle of consent, yuck. So the, the difficulty is that there's, um, the, the circle of consent is a very clear line that's made by a verbal agreement. May I, um, you know, feel you up? Yes, you may. That's an agreement. The problem is that there's a kind of a fuzzy edge here uh, where you don't really, it's not really, well, I don't really, it's not, I don't really want to go along with that, but I kind of, I don't know how to say no, or I'm afraid if I don't, then she'll be mad, or you just kind of like freeze up because you forgot that you have a choice about what happens to you. There's a muddy place here. So many people spend their entire sexual and touch lives right here. It's a very sad place to be. And 
Um, yeah, I'll come back to that when I talk about that quadrant. But there's a muddy place here where you're not really sure you want to give it, but you don't know how not to. So you kind of, well, yeah, okay. So the muddy part up here is where you move forward because you don't really know how to ask. So you just start doing stuff and you figure if it's the wrong thing, they'll tell you. Uh, or you just sort of bulldoze your way through. Um, not so useful. So, as you can imagine, when this muddy part meets this muddy part, then you got really a lot of mud, and we'll talk about that later. It's not, not a happy situation, but it's also the situation that many people are in most of the time. So that's the quadrants. Two factors. One is you're either doing or being done to, and it's either for them or it's for you. So two kinds of doing. If you're doing and it's for them, you're giving. And if you're doing and it's for you, you're taking. And there's two kinds of being done to. You're, do, you're being done to and it's for them, you're giving them the gift of yourself that's allowing. And if you're being done to and it's for you because it's the way you've asked it to be, that's receiving. If you are in the giving half, you're either giving the gift of your action or you're giving the gift of access to you, two different kinds of gifts. When you're in the receiving half, you're receiving the, their action, this kind of receiving, or you're receiving access to them, this kind of receiving, you're, you're taking action. So it's the two questions of the three-minute game that create these quadrants and create the dynamics. When I say, how would you like me to touch you, I'm stepping into here and offering this dynamic for you. And you say, gee, would you scratch my back right here? And I say, sure. Then we've created, the, our agreement has created this dynamic. When I say, how would you like to touch me? And you say, hmm, may I play with your hair and feel your back? You say, may I play with your hair and feel, my, feel your back? I say, hmm, yeah, I can let you do that. Then our agreement has set up this dynamic, and this is what we're doing. So it's the agreement that creates the dynamic. And you may, what often happens is that you may feel like you're in one, and if you feel like you're in one, you're going to assume that your partner's in the other. Uh, and that may or may not be true, because they may feel like they're somewhere else. So what you feel like is not the indicator of which quadrant you're in. It's your agreement that creates these. And it's those two questions of the three-minute game that create that agreement. So that's how all those fit together. Each of them is inherent to being human. They have nothing to do with gender. They have nothing to do with what sex you are. I've had people say, well, that's the masculine one, or that's the feminine one. Not at all. Every human being, regardless of your anatomy or your gender, needs access to each of those. So they're inherently human. They are distinct from each other. None of them are the same, although they can look similar. And I've had sometimes people say, well, these are the same to me, as if, well, that's really wonderful. Actually, it just means that you haven't found either of them. Until you can tell the difference, you're not in either of them. So each of them is inherently human. Each of them is distinct. Each of them will have its own particular challenge for you. There are some themes that run through, but yours will be unique to you. Each of them will have its ahas and its insights. Each of them will bring, give you access to a different aspect of yourself and of your eroticism. It's okay to have favorites, but avoiding one does not constitute the other one being your favorite. Dang, huh? In order to, once you have access to all of them and once you find the enjoyment in all of them, then you can claim the right to have a favorite. But until you can access all of them, you don't actually have a favorite. You're just avoiding some of them, or you haven't had the opportunity to find them yet. 
each of them is inherently enjoyable. If it's not enjoyable, you're not actually in it, you're doing something else. You haven't quite found it yet, you're doing something else. If you're in the giving half and it's not really enjoyable, what you haven't found yet is your responsibility to have a limit. And when you have a limit to what you can give uh, and you communicate that, then your giving becomes very generous and very enjoyable, both kinds of giving. If you're in the receiving half and it's not particularly enjoyable, it means you haven't yet discovered that it's really for you and that when it's for you, you get to have it the way you want it. And then it becomes inherently enjoyable. If it's not enjoyable, you haven't quite figured out that it's for you yet and you get to have it the way you want it. So each of them is inherently enjoyable. If it's not enjoyable, you're not in it, you're doing something else. Each of them can be very erotic and has a different erotic flavor when you play that play sexually. But none of them have to be erotic. They can be very comforting, cozy, affirming, very healing and nourishing. They can be really any flavor. Any of them can be just about any flavor from the comforting and cozy to the highly charged erotic to the playful to the exploratory. Um, so each of them has a particular part of your own eroticism that it will give you access to, but they're not inherently erotic, nor do they need to be. When you're giving your grandma a foot rub because she's had a long day, you're here, but it's not erotic. Or when you're holding your children to comfort them, same thing, it's not erotic. So each of them is inherently human, accessible to everyone, um, we need all of them to be mature and, and have integrity and a lot more fun. Um, they can be very erotic, but they're not necessarily erotic. Each of them will challenge you in a different way. Um, and each of them, in order to find them, you have to enter each of them one at a time. Trying to do two at once, you will not find it. And that's sometimes the most challenging part. So once you do find them, which is the purpose of the lessons and what the game opens for you, the purpose of the game is to have fun with it. The other thing that happens with the game is that each of these open up and become accessible for you. And once you learn to have that, once you learn to make an agreement and stick to your agreement, then that's when each of them opens up. And that's when each of them gives you access to a different aspect of yourself. So that's where it becomes a lifelong game, a lifelong practice, a lifelong exploring. They just get richer and deeper and more fun. Um, and again, the more clear the distinction is, the more fun they become. And that's where the three-minute game becomes a practice. Uh, and also, it can be a spiritual practice. You want to learn generosity, or you want to learn gratitude, you want to learn integrity, or you want to learn surrender. This will take you there. There's one more thing I want to add about this. What we're playing with here is taking these apart so that you can dive in and find out who you are in each of them and find the fun that's in each of them. And that is not a substitute for your life. What happens is that because these skills are so foundational to being able to relate to each other with clarity and with ease and with generosity and gratitude, as you learn this and get comfortable with it, then you carry those skills into your other times of relationship when you just want to hang out together. So. This doesn't mean that everything that's happening in your life falls into these categories. Um, what you will notice is how this applies in lots of ways that you didn't think it did before. Um, and that will happen. So it's not a, it, it clarifies the rest of your life and it gives you the skills for the rest of your life, but you, it is not a substitute for the rest of your life. It's not a substitute for those times when you just want to hang out and play together and be together and uh, without that sort of strict giving and receiving flow. So there's, there's 
giving a gift, there's receiving a gift, and then there's just hanging out together and enjoying each other. Neither, none of those are a substitute for the other. So that's the three-minute game. That's the two questions. That's the quadrants. That's how they all fit together. That's what each of them has to offer you. In the next videos, I'm going to take each of them apart and talk more about them, what, what it's like to experience them and what they can teach you. Um, hope this has been helpful for you and uh, hope you enjoy exploring it.